back on 13 years ago, if you were a Mac user, you probably had a MacBook. Perhaps a MacBook Air. Those usually had Core 2 Duo chips inside of them, which were fine for the era, but don't really hold up that well today. Well, what Apple had cooking up in the same time was only for professionals who needed a literal crap ton of performance on macOS. What they came up with was the 2009 Mac Pro. Due to me actually wanting to give this thing the best shot possible to impress me, I actually switched to it for an entire week. With my 2080 Ti, of course. My desktop is sitting next to my leg on the floor as I write this script. I may or may not have the 2008 Mac Pro, but I first wanted to make a video on this new and improved model as it really is fascinating. In 2008, you had, well, the 2008 Mac Pro, which could be configured with up to two quad-core Xeons on LGA 771, meaning that they were uh, for two quad adjacent chips. But this 2009 Mac Pro could be configured with up to two quad-core Xeons again, but on LGA 1366. How big of a difference does that make, you may ask? I mean, it is still eight cores versus eight cores. And, well, it's huge. First off, the 2008 Mac Pro could only use ECC DDR2. But this 2009 Mac Pro can use ECC DDR3 which means you can hit stupid amounts of RAM with these systems. Currently, as this one is configured, it has two Xeon X5550s, which can hit a max boost of 3.06 GHz. Based on the ne oh, geez. Ne 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 Nehalem there we go, architecture, these Xeons brought huge performance improvements over the Core 2-based predecessors. Also, my power just went out for a second. I'm really glad I have a UPS. Some of which happen to be a triple channel support, the fully shared L3 cache, and the first generation of Turbo Boost. It originally came with a Mac Edition HD4870, but I tossed that out and shoved my RTX 2080 Ti in to get the most performance possible out of these two quad cores. It also has 64 gigs of 1066 megahertz ECC DDR3. Now, I really need to talk about the design, as this is just a beautiful machine, really. As far as design is concerned, the entire exterior is ma basically made from aluminum, with the front and rear being perforated, earning the nickname the Cheese Grater. Inside the case, it's still really pretty with more aluminum with the four SATA drive bays at the top and at the bottom of the case, something not really seen on PC, a CPU card. This card houses both CPUs and all the RAM DIMMs as well as the VRMs and all that fun stuff. As far as cooling is concerned, this machine has six total fans which keep those Xeons and any GPU you have running nice and cool. And is actually, surprisingly, really quiet for having so much power going on, given the, those two Xeons are 95 watts each. Also, the carrying handles are more useful than you'd think, given this machine weighs 42 pounds! Anyways though, that's enough of me blabbing. It's now time to see how high-end 2009 server hardware can game 
in 2022. When I say we're we are gonna game, I ain't screwing around, which is why I'm tossing in some VR games once again. Sadly, due to the power supply limitations of the Mac Pro, I have no choice but to limit the power limit uh, of my 2080 Ti to 60% as otherwise Steam VR causes it to shut off immediately. Vivecraft, the Minecraft Java VR mod, ran at 28 FPS with lows dipping down to 18 FPS and was nearly unplayable due to the frame rate. Since you're moving around quite a bit, it can cause motion sickness pretty quickly. VR chat, in a complex world, ran pretty poorly as well at 26 fps with lows getting stomach churningly low to 18 fps elite dangerous in vr ran much better though at 57 fps with lows really only hitting 24 and was certainly a playable experience on the more typical games cross out ran really good at 103 fps on average with the lows dropping down to only 56 fps since Crossout is not a very CPU intensive game, that's not a real surprise. Avorian, again, with a late game shift and large battles, ran at 39 FPS on average, with lows dropping quite low down to 15 FPS. Next up is Beam and G Drive, where I drove around at very high speeds with a bolide on West Coast USA and managed a solid 62 FPS on average, with lows dropping down to 40. Rocket League ran, expectedly, very well at 146 FPS on average, with lows staying rock solid at 89. And last, but not least, Shadow of the Tomb Raider ran at 73 FPS, with lows dropping down to 55. Overall, as long as you keep your expectations in check, you can still have a rock solid gaming experience on this generation of Mac Pro or uh, this generation of server hardware for that matter. Although I wouldn't recommend going more powerful than a GTX 1070 or RTX 2060 if you are really thinking about using one of these machines. While I still don't have many apps or ideas for benchmarking the CPUs in here, I did run 3 Mark, the Blender Open Data Benchmark thing, and as a bonus, Cinebench R23. First up is Blender, and the dual Xeons here scored 62.43. To put that into reference, that score is very similar to a Ryzen 5 3400G. It was actually benchmarking both CPUs, so the fact that it takes two to almost match a quad-core APU from a few years ago is not the best. Running the CPU profile benchmark in 3D Mark resulted in a score of 1,712 points, all core, and 195 points for single core. And last, we have Cinebench R23, where these dual Xeons received a multi-core score of 4,565 points, and a single core score of 460 points, placing it behind even the Xeon X5650. So, as to be expected, it isn't a top of the line powerhouse anymore. But, it can still do things like browsing the web, watching YouTube, and general web based tasks flawlessly still, with no complaints. Anyways, I think it's time to say. A couple last words on this thing before surrendering back to my main desktop. For any of you who have made it this far into the video, well done! You get to know and keep a secret. I can trust you guys, right? So for those of whom don't know, it's actually possible to flash the 2010 Mac Pro firmware onto this 2009 model to get support for Westmere Xeons, unlocking the ability to utilize dual six core CPUs. Yep, that, that is literally what I'm doing the second I finish this video. 
I'm gonna make a video on installing the Xeon X50. I'm gonna stop my past self right there. So, in the several weeks since I shot that voiceover, some things have happened. Number one, the X5675s I bought to upgrade the uh, Mac Pro with. Uh, well, I mutilated them, trying to delid them. Yeah, that that that, that was that was really really smart. So, after not uh, after wasting twenty two dollars, I was like, you know what sounds great? Let's buy X5690s. So I bought two of them. And now we have dual six cores that are the fastest six cores you can get on the uh, Mac Pro. So I didn't make a video installing the CPUs, so that's unfortunately not going to happen. But otherwise, you'll still get that benchmark video eventually. But yes, concluding about how it is now, it's still a fine machine. As long as you go in knowing playing newer games is going to be a bit of a struggle, should still be fine. In fact, a nice tidbit about being CPU bottlenecked in games, you can just turn up the resolution. Yeah, your CPU will still push the same frames, but it'll be higher resolution. Anyways, if you can find one of these for a deal, like lower than $140, I'd say pick it up. They are still beautiful machines and aren't completely worthless, but I'd still say LGA 1155 is a much better value for gaming anyway. Well, that's it. I hope y'all enjoyed today's video. It was a fun one to make. I do have a Patreon where you can support me so I can keep making silly trades and purchases like these, and hitting the subscribe and like buttons are always appreciated as well. Anyways, DDT, out.